Thank you for joining us at Hope Lutheran Church for Worship Online. We are so glad that you are here. And if you could do us a favor, if you could like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, helps us reach more people with the good news of Jesus Christ. And we are reaching people with that good news, helping them uh, through the journey that is life. And so if you would like to help support us, there are three ways you can do so. One, you can mail in an offering to Hope Lutheran Church at 45900 Portola Avenue in Palm Desert, California, 92260. You can simply text to give by texting 84321. And finally, you can go to hopepd.org. There you'll find all of our messages and all of the incredible things like Camp Hope coming up here at Hope beginning of June. So if you're like me, you got kids around the house wondering what you're gonna do this summer, sign them up for Camp Hope. Or if you'd like to volunteer with those kids, you can find that at hopepd.org as well. So go there today and find out ways you can be involved right here with the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Now let's worship. Thank you again for joining us as we wrap up our series, Living With Yourself, Three Habits to Safeguard Your Soul. We've been exploring what the Bible says about bridging the gap between who you are on the inside and what you are presenting to the world on the outside. Two weeks ago, Giza gave us an incredible message about surrendering your will. The idea is that every morning, we should start the day by surrendering all that we are to Jesus. Last week, Rick shared with us how to monitor our hearts. That is, we need to pay attention to the seeds of guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy inside each of us and not allow them to grow. So today, we're going to talk about one more way that the Bible guides us in safeguarding our minds, hearts, and souls. So I want to begin by asking you a question. I want you to think about the person you admire the most in this world. I want you to think of someone you know personally who has made a positive impact on your life. Now keep that person in, in the back of your mind for just a bit. Now since 1946, Gallup has taken an annual opinion poll to determine the most admired man and woman in the United States and then publish the top 10 list. The names have included Dwight Eisenhower, Mother Teresa, Barack Obama, Margaret Thatcher, Pope John Paul II. Now, do you want to guess whose name has appeared the most on that list? You can pause the video and put your answer in the comments below. I'd love to see who you think. Well, the name that has appeared over 60 times on that list? Billy Graham, the former evangelist and preacher. Now, for me, one of the names I would give is standing right here. Come on over, Pastor Carl. Yes. <laughs> That's right, Pastor Carl. So why do I think of Pastor Carl when I think about someone I admire? Sure, he's good looking, but that's not the reason I admire him. He's a smart guy, but it's not his intelligence. It's the way he cares for other people, the way he gives back. I admire the way he serves. Pastor Carl has a giving heart, and that is something I admire. All right, now you can step out, Pastor Carl. Thank you. <laughs> I'm guessing that's true with the person you are thinking about, too. You might not remember so much of what they said or maybe even specifically what they did, but you'll never forget how that person made you feel. It wasn't all the stuff they had. It was more of what they gave and their authenticity that made you admire them. Rather than clinching on to what they have, the people we admire live with open hands. So I want to tell you today about someone Jesus admired. I know that's a big statement. I don't think I'd make Jesus' top 10 billion list, but this guy makes the top 10 list every year. His name is John the Baptist. 
Now, it's important to understand, at the time of Jesus, John the Baptist was a superstar. He's Luke Bryan, Kane Brown, and Chris Stapleton rolled into one. Mark introduces us to John the Baptist this way. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Essentially, it says that John appeared out of nowhere, in the middle of nowhere, proclaiming this new message out of nowhere. John's not preaching where the people are. He's preaching where the people aren't. And the people go out to him. Mark goes on and tells us, And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. In the first century, the population of Jerusalem was somewhere between 600,000 and a million people. If you add in the countryside, that would likely double that number. Throw in Galilee, then those numbers skyrocket. So if just 10% of the people went out to see John, then we have tens or hundreds of thousands of people who came out to see him. You think Coachella and Stagecoach are crowded? That's nothing. And it was not an easy, safe journey to get out to the desert area. It was a day's journey from Jerusalem through difficult, hot, rocky terrain. And still, the people flooded out to him. Why? Because John is offering something new, something different, something real. You see, in Judea, the people already had a system for the forgiveness of sins. If you wanted to be forgiven by God, you would go to the temple and offer a sacrifice of something valuable. If you were rich, it would be a lamb or an ox. If you were poor, it would be grain or a pair of turtle doves. But John's system is different. It's not about what you have, what you've clung to. It's entirely about grace. And so you'd line up by the Jordan River and John would baptize you. Now this was also strange. No one had ever baptized somebody else before. In the Jewish tradition, baptism was a ritual cleansing that you'd perform on yourself before going to the temple. But here you didn't baptize yourself. John would baptize you, which made baptism not just about you. It became about you, the community, and God, creating this intimate relationship between you and all the others being baptized. As you can imagine, this created quite a stir. The temple leaders from Jerusalem wanted to know what was happening, so they send their people to check it out. John was so popular that they wanted to know if John or others were claiming him to be the Messiah. Because whenever anyone attempted to take on that role, it usually resulted in civil unrest and bloodshed. In fact, just 25 years earlier, Herod the Great's son, Archelaus, had killed 3,000 people uprising in the streets of Jerusalem. So they asked John outright, Who are you? And he responds, Not who you think I am. I'm not the Messiah. I'm the warm-up act. I'm just here to get the crowd started. And don't leave early because the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. What John is saying is, it's not about me. It's about him. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John is saying the final sacrifice for the whole world has shown up and he has the power to pick up and carry off the sin of the world. John was absolutely convinced that it was true, that God was doing something for the world just as God had promised, and it has arrived in Jesus. John had the spotlight, but what made John different was that he wasn't afraid to give the spotlight up. Unfortunately, the same wasn't true with John's followers. They were afraid they were losing their influence. They were afraid John was letting go of his control. In the book of John, chapter 3, it says, John's disciples came to John and said to him, Rabbi, the one who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you testified, here he is baptizing and 
all are going to him. Essentially, they're saying, hey, John, that Jesus character, he's taking your business. You've got the trademark on baptisms. It's your nickname for crying out loud. Aren't you worried you're going to lose everything? Aren't you afraid you're letting go of a good thing? And what comes next is amazing and liberating because John doesn't fall for it. What he says next is the perspective that's difficult to maintain when we feel good things slipping away. It's what makes John worth admiring because it's the way to live a fuller life and to safeguard your soul. John answered, no one can receive anything except what has been given from heaven. No one can receive anything except what has been given from heaven. Think about how many variables beyond your control have made you who you are today. Did you choose your family? Did you choose your IQ? Did you choose your place of birth, health, or looks? Did you choose your hair color? Well, okay, some of you did, but you didn't choose your opportunities. There's no room for pride and no need to fear either. There's also no reason to cling to what we have. Whatever gets placed in our hands was ultimately beyond our control to begin with. John continues, He must increase, but I must decrease. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks about earthly things. The one who comes from heaven is above all. John isn't afraid to let go. He's not afraid to live with hands wide open. He says he won't start to cling to it when he feels it slipping away. Jesus wants us to live with our hands open. Through Jesus Christ, God shows us that there is a better way. You don't need to worry about being successful or accomplishing everything or being the glue that holds everything together because no one can receive anything except what has been given from heaven. It's only when we give up trying to cling to what we have that our hands are open to give away what wasn't really ours to begin with. When we live life that way, it prevents us from believing that we are a bigger deal than we actually are. Instead, it forces us to be grateful for everything that is placed into our hands because we recognize that all of it, all of it, is a gift from God. Ultimately, when we cling to the things we cannot keep, they decrease in value. What you make available to others has the potential to multiply. The value of a life is always measured in terms of how much of it was given away. Open hands are a reminder of who it all comes from. Open-handed living safeguards us from obsessing over what's there rather than who placed it there. Jesus invites you into a life of joy, contentment, and happiness, a life lived with open hands. When we are no longer afraid of losing what we have, we are free to share what we've been given. And in doing so, we find the life that Jesus died for us to have, an abundant life, a life that makes a difference now and forever. So remember, in Jesus, God has shown us the best way to live with ourselves. Surrender your will, monitor your heart, and live with open hands. Amen. Now let's pray together. Gracious God, we come before you today surrendering our will to Jesus. We come before you today asking you to cleanse our heart of jealousy, anger, greed, and envy. And we come before you today with open hands, recognizing all that we have has been placed there by you. So may we open that up to others, sharing our gifts with the world so that we can make a difference for the good news of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, once again, if you could do us a favor, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It helps us reach more people with the good news of Jesus Christ. Also, join us next week as we start a new series. Go in peace to love and serve our Lord. Thanks be to God.